this is an eastern king snake. Some people call them a chain king snake or a chain snake. And uh, they're very common out here um, on the barrier islands. And of course, all along the lowlands, along rivers and swampy areas, because, well, they like to eat other snakes. And one of the snakes they like to eat is water snakes. And water snakes live in swampy lowland areas. But you can also find them in upland habitats also. Uh, it's a little more rare. Like where I come from, up in the mountains of North Carolina, we don't see these guys very often at all. In fact, I've never found one up in my area, ever. Never seen one alive. Saw a dead one on a road once, but that's it. And these guys are just so easily easy to recognize. They're very easy to recognize because, well, their scales, their scales are shiny, very shiny. There's no keel in the middle of their scales. A lot of snakes, like that hognose, have a keel, oops, have a keel, which is a little line in the middle of each scale. This guy doesn't. He's just got that beautiful, shiny, very shiny skin. And they also have that very distinctive chain-like pattern. Now, they're also very well known because, well, they have this name King for a reason. They eat snakes. And they specialize in all snakes, but they can also eat kinks, uh, sorry, they can also eat rattlesnakes and copperheads and cottonmouths. And they're immune to the venom of those three snakes. When they encounter them in the wild, um, studies have shown that rattlesnakes, at least I saw this one time on a documentary on uh, the Discovery Channel, that uh, rattlesnakes often will just give up and let this snake eat them because they know that there's nowhere they can run that this snake can't find them because it has that forked tongue and it can follow that rattlesnake no matter where it goes and it will follow it until it finds it. Now I was told a very interesting story here uh, recently about a man out west, he was a cowboy probably back in the 1800s and he would ride around on his horse as everybody did back in those days especially cowboys and he had him a sack and in his sack he would keep a king snake and whenever he would come across a, a big rattlesnake, he would take the king snake out, lay it on the ground. The king snake would go up to the rattlesnake, and they would there would be a little bit of a fight kind of a thing where they would face each other off. And of course, eventually the um, king snake would get the rattlesnake to rear up into a strike position, and then the king snake would grab a hold of its throat and wrap around it because they are a very powerful constrictor. And then it would wrap around the king snake, or the, I'm sorry, wrap around the rattlesnake, kill it, and then swallow it down. And that's what they do. So if you ever see a black snake with cross bands like this, leave it alone. They're very beneficial snakes. They don't only eat kinks, uh, rattlesnakes and copperheads, but they eat all kinds of other snakes. As much as I love snakes, I don't want to have the world crawling in snakes because it would be dangerous. So we need to have control of some of the snakes. So that there's a balance. That's what it's all about, a balance of nature. So I'm going to put this snake up. Not before I let you say goodbye, though. And that was cool, wasn't it? <laughs> and this last snake is one of my all-time favorites, corn snake. And it was the first pet snake that I ever had, was a corn snake. And, well, you're probably wondering why is it called a corn snake? Well, it's because they eat corn on the cob. Not. They actually are called that because, look at the belly. The belly of the snake looks somewhat like Indian corn. And if you're not familiar with what that is, just Google it. Uh, Indian corn has this similar pattern. And also, years and years ago, when corn snakes were first discovered, I, I suppose, or they were first being discovered, they would be found in barns and corn cribs, places where you find a lot of corn. Well, what else do you find where there's a lot of corn? Rodents, because rodents like to eat corn. Well, that's what this snake was looking for, it was rodents, like mice and rats and things like that, because this is a corn snake, which is a very powerful constrictor. They're just an incredibly muscular snake. Of course, they use that muscle when they get a mouse to wrap around it and squeeze it really tight and kill it and then, of course, swallow it down whole. Look how beautiful she is. These patterns are just incredible. Now, unfortunately, 
The patterns on the corn snake are often confused with the patterns on the copperhead. Um, copperheads and corn snakes are very different. They're such different animals. Copperheads are a big heavy bodied snake. Corn snakes are very long and thin and just totally different. Look how small her head is compared to her neck. Her head really much tapers right back into her neck. But with a copperhead, their head's about twice as wide as their neck. You're probably wondering about her eyes. Now she's an older snake. She's about 14, so she has cataracts. And she can't see very well, just like the um, hognose snake. They're both elderly, so I'm being very gentle with her. And here is a copperhead. It's mounted, of course. I wouldn't put a live one that close to my head. And a um, corn snake. So you can see the patterns are very different. Just look at the scales on the copperhead. For one thing, they have killed scales, and the scales on the corn snake are not killed. They're not as heavily killed. And of course, the copperhead's head, looking at its head, very narrow, or very. Of course, the copperhead's head, looking at its head up here, um, it's triangular shaped, much uh, wider, because it has to have a place to store its venom. Whoa! So. That is the most beautiful corn snake. One of my favorite snakes. Hello. <laughs> tickly. Very tickly little tongue you have there. So I'm going to put her up. Take a look at this big gator skull. This is an ancient gator. He was probably about 15 feet long. And the history on this gator, no one really knows. Other than he's been here a long time. And, uh, Hey, that's a heavy skull. I wouldn't want that thing latching onto me from a, if I was swimming across some little slough out in the middle of a back country of one of these islands. If it latched onto you, there'd be nothing left. And, well, he doesn't have any teeth, not a tooth in his head. But uh, imagine the, when he was fully, uh, fully uh, uh, but imagine when this gator was alive, what kind of damage he could do to you if you were a raccoon or an armadillo or something. Wow, it's amazing. The size of those teeth, bigger than my thumb. If there was a tooth in there, that's where the tooth would go in these holes. Look at that. And of course, his little brain, probably the size of, well, not much bigger than that. <laughs> that's all he needs though, really. Amazing creatures. I wish we could have seen a big live one. We've seen some amazing creatures here today, that's for sure. And I'd like to say thank you to the folks from the Hunting Island State Park Nature Center. They've been a great help, and hopefully you guys out there have learned something. And uh, I'll see you again next time on Wild Adventures with Steve. Is a